last week we opened up with citing James chapter three and noting the responsibility of teachers. And that's certainly something we take very, very seriously. And we open again by citing the words, no need to turn them up, you know them, where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 that my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. As our brother said in his prayer, you know, there's plenty of that, plenty of error that goes on. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's what we do as brethren in Christ, as Christadelphians, is that we... uh, we're only interested in what the authority of the word says. <clears throat> and I include this quote in our introductory slide from the forward of Christendom Astray, talking about the work of Brother Roberts, and his single objective was to promote the personal study of the Holy Scriptures with a view to salvation. And as Paul said to the Corinthians, it was not to have dominion over their faith. It was merely to be a helper. And that's our whole goal is so that we become our own interpreters of the Bible. And that doesn't mean whatever we get out of it is correct. It means that we understand the tools to rightly divide the word of truth. And that, that really is all that uh, scriptural reference means to us. Sorry, accidentally hit something here. Um, in Hebrews chapter one, the very beginning of Hebrews, which has a lot to talk about the law and the prophets and the quotation out of the Psalms, it states that God who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in times past by unto the fathers by the prophets in these last days has spoken unto us in his son so there were various times in diverse manner or as it really means many parts that the inspired word the scriptures were given unto us and this is how we want to open the class um, brethren is demonstrating this it is absolutely the duty of you and i as students of the bible to piece together scriptures it's been written that particular way as Hebrews is a demonstration of, we've got to take things through different parts of the word, as Brother Thomas suggested, and bring them all together in a harmonious doctrine. And here's a couple of examples of this. And I don't know if you have this, but you may want to just write it down. And we'll go through some of these slides very, very quickly because the PDFs are being uh, supplied for you. But this is a good exercise here on Romans uh, 15, verses 8 through 12, where The apostle is quoting the patriarchs, David, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And he's weaving together that the covenants of promise were all about the fact that the Gentiles would be a part of that. We know that that's why Abraham's name was changed to Abraham, that he would be a father of multitudes. All that's borne out in Romans chapter 4. But he, in this this, uh, course of five verses, he is quoting from different parts of the word. And your margin will have these. Most of you, your margin will have these where it's cited from. It's just showing you that as it is written, and again he saith, and again, and that he said, praise be all the Gentiles, verse 11. Isaiah saith in uh, verse 12, there should be a root coming out of uh, Jesse that will rise as as really a sign, and he will reign over the Gentiles. The Gentiles will come in trust. That's all the quotation from the patriarchs, from the law, from the Psalms, and from the prophets. So that we have to weave those together as the apostle did to get one uniform piece of scripture. And that's all that slide is meant to demonstrate. We find it again in Acts chapter two, when um, Peter is now expounding the purpose of the Lord's death and resurrection, where he quotes from Joel, he literally says this, he says, they're not drunk as you suppose, but this was the prophecy that was spoken of by Joel He quotes from Joel chapter 2. Then he goes right on and says, David spoke concerning him. He quotes Psalm 16. And then he said, David went on to say, he will not leave his soul in the grave. He won't suffer his holy one to see corruption. That's a quote from another psalm. Being a prophet, he says in verses 29 and 30, knowing that God had sworn to him by an oath. And your margin, again, will take you right over to 2 Samuel 7. That's the covenant given to, to David. And then he said, David himself is not ascended into the heavens. He's speaking of someone else. That is the Lord. Yahweh said unto my Adon, or my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy fools, thy, uh, thy foes thy footstool. Which, of course, is quoted in Psalm 110. So again, here's another demonstration. And you can go back and, and mark these in your, your spare time if you don't have them. Show that you got to assemble the scriptures together and find out where the references are quoted. Now, in the bottom red there, we have this statement 
that same assembling of diverse parts of scripture is necessary to open up types and parables, the prophetic parable, so to speak. And what our brother read for us uh, this evening is an example of that. In Acts 1, verses 14 through 20, this is Peter concerning Judas Iscariot, where he says, men and brethren, verse 14 says they're all assembled here for this purpose. The scripture must needs be fulfilled, which by the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of David, spake concerning Judas. And your margin will tell you that this is quoted in Psalm 41. The Holy Spirit is designated by the mouth of David that he's speaking of Judas Iscariot. And when you look at Psalm 41, he says, my own familiar friend, something we know, has lifted up his heel against me. And Psalm 41 will tell you that is quoted out of the incident of Ahithophel during the literal reign of David. So David and what he experienced with Ahithophel is quoted in the Psalms, quoted in 2 Samuel 15, telling us that the things that happened to David and the betrayer, betrayal of Ahithophel, they were absolutely literal historical events, brothers and sisters. But Peter is telling us it was also a prophecy concerning Judas Iscariot. So that's all we look to, uh, to demonstrate from those particular references right now, brothers and sisters, is just showing in Romans and in Acts that you have to weave together different parts of the word. And then in this case, in Acts chapter one, it actually clearly tells us that Ahithophel was a type of Judas Iscariot. And you do that by weaving together scriptures. So that's how David being a prophet and speaking by the Holy Spirit foreshadowed Judas Iscariot. He did that through the little, literal events that he experienced in his own life. Now, of course, that is not very, very difficult to comprehend, just where we want to set the basis. Now, the, 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 the principal point of this class, brothers and sisters, is Bible chronology, that things are set forth in a deliberate, distinct order of sequence in the scriptures couple of fundamental things of that. We know that Adam was first born, then Eve. There's an order in the resurrection, Christ the first fruits. After that, those that are Christ that is coming. With the 12 disciples, when that list is given, Peter named first, Judas Iscariot last. Hebrew 7, speaking of Melchizedek. He first, being by interpretation, was the king of righteousness. After that, the king of peace. Because you can't have peace unless there's righteousness in the earth. So these are some of the fundamentals of chronology in the Bible. You know that, of course, the situation with Jezebel, there could be no peace as long as she was able to exist. We have it with first the natural, then the spiritual. The first came out, Esau, hairy, red like, uh, like a hairy garment, which, by the way, is the uh, Hebrew seir, it's tied to the word devil, and you'll find that there are two different types of people. Those that serve the flesh, the devil, that's a standing principle and a parable in and of itself. We can discuss it at a different time. And then those of the spirit come after. You have that with Ishmael before Isaac and many, many other cases, Cain and Abel. You know the sequence. So the chronology of Bible is very significant for us, brothers and sisters. The imprint of that is found everywhere in the scriptures. Now, this is taken from the expositor from Brother H.B. Mansfield, where he says this in the Genesis expositor, that every book in the Bible typifies the purpose of Christ, God, I'm sorry, purpose of God in Christ in some way. Then he says this. Moreover, the various books of the Bible, considered in groups, set forth in sequence the same divine purpose. Thus, inspiration seems not only to have dictated the words in Scripture, but the very setting of the books. And then he lays out the example of that in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You have the calling out of the people, you have the fellowship, you have the guidance and the offerings, and you've finally given to the new generation that will go into the land under Joshua. And you can sift through that in your own particular time. He goes on to say that when you set forth these historical books, they foreshadow the type 
of the past in the future work of Christ. Joshua leads them, shows them the way into the land through baptism. Judges, we know it happens. No king in Israel. They turn to apostasy. Ruth, the Gentiles brought in. Samuel, the kingdom now is established. Kings, it's the golden age where Solomon reigns. The Chronicles and the temple. It's all the whole first of Chronicles is about the temple worship. It's all about divine worship. So in that chronological order of the books, you have the purpose of God set forth. And by the way, Brother Thomas brings this out, and I believe it's Elpis Israel. I'm almost certain that it's Elpis Israel, where he says that, note that it was the things of the kingdom, then the name of Jesus Christ. The disciples preached the kingdom, not even knowing specifically the sacrifice and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe he says, and somebody can clean up this language, I'm sorry, should have it for you, I'm paraphrasing. Where the kingdom of God is omitted or made a matter of speculation, the gospel is not proclaimed. And he's, his principal point in the length of his statement is that the church is talking about Christ and salvation, and they never talk about the kingdom and don't address it. Gospel isn't preached. So we even have to, in our own exposition of the word, Make sure that we have the order correct and that we don't remove Israel and the Hebrew kingdom from the elements of the king of the kingdom and only talk about the elements of salvation, because then it just becomes all about human salvation. So look what you find here in this chronology of the books laid out, as Brother uh, Mansfield suggests. I just think this is phenomenal, brothers and sisters. You have the death of Moses, which we talked about before. The law can't give inheritance, show the, the feebleness of man. You've got Joshua, who brings them into the land. And by the, by the way, uh, H.P. Mansfield says in his expositor, you know, most men would look at, not knowing the type, they would look at Joshua and go, well, he was a failure. He didn't inherit all the land for him, and then he died. Well, that was Christ's first advent. He was never intended to gain the inheritance for you and I. He brought us through baptism, Jordan. He showed us the way. He said there is much land to be inhabited. There are, are enemies that have to be driven out, men of the flesh, before it can be inherited. Then you have the book of Judges. The Jews turn to apostasy and Ruth, the Gentiles, cause. Isn't that incredible about the Gentile times? The Jews go to apostasy and the Gentiles being grafted in. We noted that in the chronology of the purpose of God. And then you have David, speaking of looking forward to the greater of David in Samuel, where David establishes the kingdom that it's in its golden age, a kingdom of peace under Solomon. We'll get to that later in our studies. Temple prepared. It's restored from that, taken down by Babylon, Ezra and Nehemiah. Then the bride is exalted, the faithful saints in the book of Esther. And, you know, I found this in my own studies uh, just by happen chance when I saw this pattern that H.P. Mansfield brought out. So I looked up in Strong's during this particular period of Judges and Ruth, where after Joshua's death, and by the way, in the guidebook of the uh, formation of Ecclesia, Brother Roberts points this out. And he says, we're in that condition. With the Joshua and the elders that outlived them died, and the people turned to apostasy. And Brother Roberts points out, we're after that same type. We don't have spirit-guided elders anymore. They, they lasted during Joshua and those that outlived him. Now we're trying to govern the Ecclesia, void of that Holy Spirit presence. And in the red at the very bottom, I found something interesting, unless someone can prove it with some other uh, facts. And I certainly will stand down on that. You know, the kingdom, the word kingdom, never appears in the book of Judges or Ruth. Isn't that phenomenal? We're in the period right now where the political kingdom of Israel has collapsed Salvation has been extended to the Gentiles until they be grafted back in. And in that period of Judges and Ruth, the term kingdom does not appear. That's what I found in my own studies. Isn't that remarkable to go along with this uh, layout of the chronology? And we've looked at these before. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you initially, we're going to move through these very quickly because I want to get to, God willing, implementing the chronology and take a living example where it appears implementing the chronology. So we looked at these before, and I believe in our first class, 
and we saw the pattern of it. But we want to note that the chronology is also specific and significant to the doctrine that is being explored there. Abraham, there is unquestionably consistently a consistency in the chronology. And it's one that teaches the doctrine of the Abrahamic seed, both the seed after the flesh and after the spirit. And you find it in those concurrent chapters. And it's brought out in Galatians, Galatians 4 and Romans 4. Jacob, where the doctrine of the nation of Israel, Romans 9 through 11, is addressed, you have him driven from the land, deceiving the father, and all the things that happens to Jacob the person whose name is changed to Israel, then he's ultimately brought back in because he's representing and coinciding with the doctrine of the nation of Israel, which is what his name is changed to. In Joseph, you have the doctrine of the Redeemer, the one that will redeem his brethren. And the chronology that exists there, brothers and sisters, is in perfect chronological order and harmony of that very doctrine. And at the bottom there, brothers and sisters, I have the exodus of Israel coming out of Egypt. And you'll know this for, forms, is it part three? I'm sorry, or part third of Elpis Israel. I've forgotten what it is. It's the title of that last section, really, of Brother uh, Thomas in Elpis Israel, where he addresses the second exodus. And he cites all those references in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Micah, where he says that he will bring them back from the land after the manner that he brought them out of Egypt in the days of Moses. So that is setting forth a pattern. Of course, we have that in the book of Revelation where the song of Moses is sung. So all of these things are telling us that the doctrine and the chronology corresponds with what the teaching is that Yahweh has intended for us. Samuel, it's the righteous judge to redeem Israel. And if you look at how... There's a seed of the woman, Hannah borrows, or Mary borrows from the prayer of Hannah. Samuel given to Yahweh all his days like Christ was. The light of the temple goes out. The word was very, very rare in those days. The prophets have been silenced for 400 years. Then what happens? The apostasy, Dagon takes it, and it's in a woeful state. And the kingdom of God is established. And then with Solomon, you have the kingdom in the age to come. The Sabbath rests. There's no warfare. It's 40 years where he has a unified um, Judah and Israel reigning under him as one king. Esther. I would suggest to you, brothers and sisters, it's you and I. It opens, it literally opens with the kingdom. It has a rear showing the glory of his kingdom. Before he gets to Mordecai, the savior. So it's the things of the kingdom of God, then the name of Jesus Christ. And Vashti, who is a bride, typical of Israel, she doesn't need the king anymore. She has her own beauty. She'll stand by her own. And she has stepped, moved to the side, and the Gentile, the hidden Jew, so to speak, during this Gentile time is brought in, and you know what happens thereafter. Ruth, it's the doctrine of the Gentiles graft in during the period of judges, during the period of the Jewish apostasy. So this pattern, this chronology of the gospel, brothers and sisters, I would suggest to you, is embedded everywhere in Scripture. The guidebook of the Old Testament. I'm sorry. This would be guidebook to the New Testament. Brother Mansfield says this. Old, new, what's the difference, brother? Uh, it's the New Testament. Um, he says that Matthew lays out a very systematic manner where the miracles are recorded. It is not in chronological order. But in the pattern of miracles, it's in deliberate outline sequence so that we look at the miracles in sequential orders. Luke, however, sets the facts in literal sequential order. So he goes on to say, and this, by the way, you'll have at the back of these notes. We'll have no time to get to it. When the PDF is sent out, you can look at this where he says the work of inspiration and note this second quote has not only been responsible for the words in which the Holy Scripture has been recorded, we all agree with that, it's, I think it's Article 1 of our Statement of Faith, but the very setting of the books themselves. And he talks about Romans, not literally the first book written, but it's placed first. 
And you just follow that pattern throughout the seven ecclesias that he addresses and the order that they are laid down. And I believe very firmly, brothers and sisters, they correspond with the one day equaling a thousand years laid down in the works of creation. And those will be at the notes at the back of the PDF. You can investigate them on your own. To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And Brother Mansfield suggests in the guidebook to the New Testament, study them in the order that they were written. Timothy was a Jew. Titus was a Gentile. Timothy was dealing with Jewish problems. People trying to teach the law didn't even understand it. Saying the law is great if a man uses it lawfully. Talking about the tradition of the faith embraced by his grandmother, then his mother. And he was his own son begotten by the truth. Not so, Titus. He was a Gentile who he deliberately did, did not circumcise. Timothy, he did to show the principle. He's dealing with Gentile pro pro problems in Titus, is which we deal with. Idolatry. Difficult things like this in our age. So that's what he was dealing with in the time. You had Judaism and idolatry. Don't give heed to Jewish fables. We ourselves were foolish, serving diverse lots. So here's the two sons of the faith, the Jew and Gentile. As a father with a son, he served with me in the gospel. So you got Timothy and Titus in the chronology laid out there. You have it in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Book of Acts is laid out almost literally in two sections. The first half is about Peter. You'll notice on that little chart there that the same things that happened to Peter happened to Paul. From the first address to the lame man healed to the sorcerer laying on hands, they're each worshipped. There's someone raised from the dead. They're both imprisoned. But Peter was given to the circumcision. It says that in Galatians 2 and verse 7. The gospel was for Peter to the circumcision. The gospel was to meet Paul to the uncircumcision, the Gentiles. And again, Peter's dealing with a legalism. Jerusalem is the center. Antioch is the center for Paul. He's dealing with Gentile issues, a lot of idolatry that's going forth. Jews in the land, Jews in dispersion. And again, this is to, to the average person, brothers and sisters, people that don't hold this treasure in earth and vessels. These are just facts. But to you and I, it's like, well, this solidifies the chronology of the gospel, how we embrace it and how we believe it. It's really wonderful. So to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And here's where we, where we want to go with the class, brothers and sisters. We want to have a look at a couple of the accounts in Luke. Okay, we have about 30 minutes to do that, I understand. So we're told in the very first verse that Luke is, as Brother Mansfield already suggested, is set forth in order. It's a sequential order. It notes the Lord's age at 8, 12 years old, I'm sorry, 8 days old. 12 years old and 30 years old. So this pattern is throughout the scriptures. And one thing I think you find notably, we know the gospel is to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. One thing we find notably, I believe, in Luke, and I've just taken up a study with this. And if you, by the way, if you've heard any classes on uh, my brother Jim Cowie, <clears throat> he and I have been corresponding, I think, a couple of years ago about this. Um, and he was just talking about, yeah, the, the chronology is after the pattern of the gospel. And we noted this, I believe, I think last week in the classes, that here's chronology. In chapter 9, verse 1, he sent out 12 disciples to the Jew first. Chapter 10, verse 1, he sent out 70, representing the Gentile nations. Okay, it's not hard to comprehend. But look at this pattern as it goes forth, okay? Here is a pattern set forth in Luke Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through the remaining of the chapter, where the gospel is absolutely in chronological order to what you and I comprehend. It's the pattern of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, so on and so forth. As he is speaking, his mother and his brethren come to the press. It was told him, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without. And we know what that phrase means. Those in the truth are called within. Those without are those not in the truth. And they were desiring to restrain him. 
The thought was he was beside himself. He was mad. He was making things very, very uncomfortable. His own family after the flesh. He answers and said, who is my mother and my brethren? It's those that hear the word. So now he sets the pattern of a divine family, brothers and sisters. That's the family of Messiah. When it is directly brought to his attention, that his natural family is actually trying to restrain him and suppress his preaching. So it comes to pass, the next verse, he went into a ship with the disciples and said, let us go to the other side of the lake. He's now leaving Jewry. After his natural family after the flesh has sought to restrain him and marginalize his teaching, and he declares who his family is. He enters into a ship. It's the vessel of salvation with his disciples. That's what he said. Who is my family? It's his disciples. And he goes to the other side of the lake or the sea, as it is in Matthew 8. That's what the parallel account says. We looked at before. It represents in the very creation record. It represents the nations, the nations of the Gentiles. So after leaving the Jews, remember Jonah and the sign of Jonah. He goes into a ship. He's figuratively cast into the sea three days and three nights dead and vomited up on the land of the Gentiles. And the Lord Jesus Christ falls asleep in the ship. We know that is a description of the state of the dead. And the storm of wind blew on the lake. They came, awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. It's different than sleeping. We know how that term is used different. We know that from first principles when we're talking to the unbeliever. Some brethren are asleep waiting the resurrection. Those in ignorance perish. Then he arose, same word that is used for the resurrection of Christ, exact same Greek word. And he rebukes the wind and the raging water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. That's what the death of Christ did. And the record actually says that he was in Mark. He was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. His head was on a pillow. He is the head of the body, the firstborn from the dead, says Colossians 1. His head is on a pillow in the vessel of salvation, which is what some have made faith shipwreck, says Paul to Timothy. He is the first to rise from the state of the dead. That's important. Because they say if he does not arise, the disciples say, we will perish. That is exactly the principle that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. It's on your screen. screen. We'll quote it. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. And all they that are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. There's no hope of the resurrection. If that man does not rise from his head on a pillow in the hinder part of the ship, where he's asleep, we're perished. Our hope is in the resurrection of dead. It's all of what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. And he said, where is your faith? They being afraid wondered. And they said, what manner of this? He commands, commands. Even the winds and the water, they obey him. Now we know what the winds represent. They represent false teaching. And the waters of the people stirred up by that false teaching. And that wavering is spoken of in those terms in James chapter 1. The wavering of your faith, like the sea that wavers. It's spoken of again in Ephesians 4 verse 14. Being tossed no more to and fro 
with false and every wind of doctrine. Christ has stabilized that. The reconciliation of all the law and the prophets in the Old Testament scriptures has been reconciled by the death and subsequent resurrection of Christ. Remember our first or second clash. When he broke bread, their eyes were open and they knew it was him that all was fulfilled in the law of prophets and Psalms concerning it. All things were brought together by the death and resurrection of Christ. And the wind in the sea has now been arrested. He commanded them to cease. It was a command of doctrine being fulfilled in Christ. And so they arrived at the country of the Gentiles, Galilee, called Galilee of the Gentiles. So they leave Jewry, his family after the flesh. They go out into a ship where he falls asleep in the waters because the word's now going to the Gentiles. He's resurrected so they don't perish. The doctrine of false doctrine is arrested by Christ's death and resurrection. It was the essential doctrine to absolutely bring together all the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And what happens? He goes there and he meets you and I, a bunch of Gentiles that are in the state of death, whose thinking is off. No clothing, no atonement, multiple devils, many issues. The world even says that. They do in this country. Oh, he's got demons he's wrestling with. Like he, somebody's got a lot of personal problems, is kind of what they're saying. He didn't abide in a house where he abode was in a state of death among the tombs. That's where we are. It's a metaphor for one under the bondage of sin and death. There is no hope for it. But now Christ has gone to the Gentiles, where a madman is dwelling in the tombs. To be carnally minded is death, says the Apostle Paul. There's a reason that this man known as Legion, a multiplicity, is dwelling among the tombs, who cleaves to Christ more than his own natural relatives after the flesh trying to restrain him. There was more fruit found among the Gentiles who were mad. And he went on and on and told the Jews that during his ministry, and they would not hear it. If Sodom and Gomorrah would have heard these things, if they would have heard these things that are preached unto you, they would have repented. Jesus cried out, and he fell out before him, so he sees him, and he cries out with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, thou son of the most high God? Quite a statement. Don't have time to deal with it. I beseech thee. He's falling down in submission. He's crying out to the Lord Jesus Christ, not standing without, looking to restrain him, not saying that he's beside himself has devils. This is the man that knows he has devils. He doesn't think Christ is crazy. He knows he's crazy. It's wrong thinking of the unclean spirit, which, by the way, is a Gentile term. You get that all the way back in the law. Unclean animals were Gentiles. The unclean men and women represent Gentiles. You get that all throughout the law and the prophets. And so he commanded, remember again, he commanded. That means something to us. The unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes he caught him, he was kept bound with chains, he break them. It's the word healing this man that the record in Mark 5 says no man could bind. He styled in the parable the strong man that no man could bound. It's the prince of the power of the air that works in the spirit of men. In this, there is they're unshackled by law. They do what they want to do. There's a multiplicity of their sins and works of the flesh, and they cannot be restrained. Now, I don't know what it's like in the UK, brothers and sisters. In America, there is nothing restrained. It is crazy. What goes on is normal. And he's in the wilderness. He's driven into the wilderness. And that term means no inheritance. So Jesus asked, saying, what is thy name? 
he says, a multiplicity of devils, legion. A multiplicity of devils, brothers and sisters, is associated with personality disorder, schizophrenia, genuine mental disorder. Because there are many works of the flesh. Wouldn't it be easier for all of us, brothers and sisters, if there were just one or two? Oh, just don't lust the things of the world. And then you'd be, there's a multiplicity of problems with the flesh. Some of you are drunkards. Some of you are thieves. Some of you are abusers of mankind. Some of you, I mean, there are a multiplicity of problems with the flesh, and we all have them. So it's a Roman term, a legion representing a large company. Some brethren have said that it represents 6,000, that actual number. Now, how significant is that? And what we read from the gospel records, brothers and sisters, it doesn't make any difference what social background you came from. It does not matter what disease we have, so to speak. The record says that Christ went through every town and village healing all manner of disease among the people. The truth can heal anything. If you're a drunkard, a thief, abuser of yourself, of mankind, some of it is given totally to the things of this world. The truth heals all manner of disease among the people. And here's a man with a multiplicity of it dwelling in death. And they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. And there was a herd of swine feeding. And you know what swine are? They're unclean animals under the law because they do two things. They chew of the cud in a sense, but a swine also eats flesh. It's, it's not like a cow. It isn't like a horse in that manner. It's not like a sheep or a goat. A swine will eat flesh. Regardless of their hooves, they're an unclean animal. They besought him that he would suffer them to enter in unto them. No taste for the truth. They went out of the man that says in verse 33, entered into the swine. They went violently into the steep place and they're choked in the sea. And Micah, the Bible interpreting itself, says, casting all their sins in the depth of the sea. This is a baptism of sorts, brothers and sisters. It is a choking of the unclean things represented in the legion, in the spirit of uncleanness, put into the swine, taken down into the waters of baptism. There was a herd, it says Mark 5, of about 2,000. It's the Gentile period, we'll see in just a moment, before he returns back to Jewry. They're choked out, perishing in the waters. And they that fed them saw, and they went and fled and told everyone in the city. They went out to see what was done, and they saw the man, says the, verse 35, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, atoned for we met him, he had no clothes. He was dwelling among the tombs and he was crazy. And in his right mind, it's the parable of redemption. He's the new man in Christ, putting off the old man and the old way of thinking. And it was told them by what means the one that was possessed with devils was healed. It's the same word, exact same word healed as he came to save his people from their sins. All salvation, although it's a physical malady, the root cause is always sin, as Brother Barling said. So every cure ultimately is traced back to sin in its principal form. Carnal thinking is what the issue, which is why so many times in the gospel records, brothers and sisters, you have the Lord Jesus Christ curing mental disposition and mental diseases. The whole multitude of the country, the Gentiles don't want him. They want him to depart out of there. They're taken with great fear. They don't want the word. The multitude of the Gentiles don't want to hear it, brothers and sisters. How many people do you talk the truth to? They don't care. They don't care. Now, the man in whom the devils were departed, he wanted to stay with Christ he besought him that he might be with him. But you and I, the herd was about 2,000. Our time of being with Christ is not currently. 
we know it's just the period of the Gentiles, brothers and sisters. We're not going to stay with him right now. We're being called to a principle of salvation that will be realized at his return. And so he says in verse 39, you return to thine own house, show how great things that have done. And he went his way and he proclaimed the truth to the whole city, the gospel proclamated. And he now returns to a house, the ecclesia, one that he did not have when he had no house and clothes and he was dwelling among the tombs and he was a wild man. He's now a member of the brotherhood, brothers and sisters. So it comes to pass in the very next verse, Jesus returns back to the Jews. He now, after trying to be restrained, suffers the typical death and resurrection, calms the waves and the winds, goes to the Gentiles, heals the Gentiles, a herd of about 2,000, comes back to the Jews, and they receive him gladly, and they're waiting for him. It's the Savior at his second advent, like Joseph the second time revealing himself. And behold, what happens but one who is fixed on the law of Moses comes out to meet him. Jairus by name. The ruler of the synagogue now does the same thing that the Gentile does, and he falls at his feet. And he beseeches him to come into his house. That's submission, brothers and sisters. He's a ruler of the synagogue for a reason. He's someone who is a legalist. He's now inviting Jesus to enter into the Jewish house. And what is the case there? And you know how the prophets talk about the daughters of Zion, the daughters of Israel, prophetic of natural Jews. He's got a daughter and she's 12 years old, the number of the house of Israel. And she's laying, dying, just like Ishmael, at the very point of his death. Hagar cast him a far way off, says, let me not see the death of the child. And when he's at the very eve of his death, like the Jews will be in Armageddon, Yahweh opens her eyes and she sees the Abrahamic well. That's what happens in the allegory of Genesis 21. Same thing here. As he goes there, there's a woman having an issue blood 12 years, and she spent all of her living on her physicians. Not only was she not healed, Mark says her condition grew worse. Before he can resurrect the nation, he has got to clean the issue of uncleanness. There's a problem with uncleanness, with an issue of blood among the Jews before he can nationally resurrect them. And this is a more mature woman, a woman of responsible age. And physicians are those that don't feel that they need a remedy for sin. I have not come to call the righteous who say, we don't need a physician. I've come to call sinners is what Christ said. And Brother David Perry referred to us a couple of weeks ago to the reference in Isaiah 64, verse 6, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And you'll know that that term means menstrual cloths. It's a woman with an issue of blood. And she needs to be healed because it's a condition of uncleanness that any woman, whether she brought forth a son or daughter, even Mary, under the law, Leviticus 12, had this issue of blood and had to be cleaned cleansed of her uncleanness and she came behind events that follow his second advent and touched the border of his garment and her issue of blood dried up by the border of his garments but the law said you shall look at the border of the garment of blue and remember the commandments it's the commandments and the atonement brothers and sisters Obedience to the commandments will bring atonement. She touches the thing that represented the commandments and the garment, the thing that makes for atonement, because there's no atonement if we just go live life like we want to. So the cause of sin and death 
he's now removed. We don't have time for those quotes back from the Leviticus expositor that talk about this issue of uncleanness. Jesus said, who touched me? All denied, Peter said, there's a multitude around. Can you ask who touched you? But she said, if I can just touch his clothes, if I can find a covering by identifying with the commandments, I'll be cleansed. She said she knew she had to touch his clothes and she had to touch the border of his garments. She knew he was a fulfillment of the law. He said, somebody touch me. Virtue is a character, brothers and sisters. Virtue has gone out of me. Virtue is a character. It's obedience to the, she attached herself to him, brothers and sisters. It's the uncleanness of the removal of a woman. That's Ezekiel 36. The sin and rebellion of the house of Israel will be, I'm quoting, as the uncleanness of a removed woman from which they will be cleansed. That's what Ezekiel 36, the language that is employed, is phenomenal. When the women saw she was not hid, there's the open admission of where she is. She comes and falls down before him like Jairus, submission, or Jairus. And she was now immediately healed. It's a good confession of faith before many witnesses, brothers and sisters. And he said, daughter, she's now brought into the household. Who did Christ say were his brothers and his sisters, his sons and daughters? Those that do his commandments. The second time when he returns to Jewry, after about 2,000 period of the swine, he's going to heal them. And by the way, the references are there. Just study this out in your own time. Brother Thomas talks about this. Faith in the last days and many other places. Faith is not just a term that means belief. The law of faith is what it's called. Faith is a system of things put in by Christ in contrast to the law of Moses. It is called the law of faith from which you could not be justified under the law of Moses. Faith is not just a term that means belief. And there are the New Testament references if you want to look them up. Faith is a term, Brother Thomas is very correct when he says that, that means atonement through Christ doesn't just mean belief. And as he yet spake, there came one from the synagogue's house saying, trouble not the master, thy daughter is dead. The law could not redeem. Could not redeem. It was weak through the flesh as the ruler of the synagogue experienced. No man can fulfill it. To fail in one point was to fail in them all. When Jesus heard it, he answered, saying, Fear not, believe only, she shall be made whole. The term daughter is used three times in this account. This is the third time that's used. We've already talked about numbers. It represents resurrection. And Jairus means to enlighten. The light shining forth to give light as an enlightenment of knowledge representing the day of Christ appearing that will enlighten the Jews. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in except the men that there were the disciples that were with him and the father and mother of the maiden. So now he's got members of the fleshly family that are now being brought to the part of the family after the spirit. And all wept and bewailed her. And he said, weep not. She's not dead and she doesn't perish. She's sleeping. There is a doctrinal difference between those two things. Weep not. It's a condition of Israel and dispersion. The weeping will be done. And the ones that laughed him to scorn, that still reject the Messiah, and when they're brought into the wilderness of the peoples, as the prophet says, they're put outside the house. There will still be Jews that reject Christ at his return. And he says to the maid, calls her and says, arise. This is the third time 
dead is used. And the word arise is exactly the same word used for the resurrection of the nation of Israel. He is torn. After two days, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. Hosea 6 and 1, verse, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It's the physical resurrection of the nation in the latter days. And her spirit, the new heart and the spirit, not after the old law, says Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but I will give to her a new spirit and a new law enters into her. And what does he do? He changes her diet. And you and I both know that Hebrews chapter 5, when the apostle is talking about milk and we have to go on to the meat, uh, John Martin, study notes on Hebrews have this, Brother John Martin. The word milk there means the law. He changes her diet to meat. It's now time to understand nationally the things of Christ. Her parents are astonished. He charged them that they should tell no man what was done. The curing of both daughters, brothers and sisters, in these two events are drawn together in all three gospel records. It represents the kingdom of Israel restored. And the number 12, of course, representing the Israel of God. And in each case, the physical presence of Christ, as with Lazarus, couldn't do it when he was out of his midst because he represents the nation in that sense, is required for the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, he shall live. It literally requires, not if someone's sick, if someone is dead, the physical appearance of Christ in their physical midst to raise them up from the dead. And that's what happens in this case, brothers and sisters. Um, uh, that's a perfect place to stop because we talked about this last time, the chronology of the, the, the feasts and how they represent the parable of foundation, uh, the parable of uh, salvation and foundation that's laid in law of prophets. So brothers and sisters, we're right at time and we'll leave off there right now and not going to some of these other references. Mm -hmm.